I can hear you. Perfect. Um, you can hear me? Yes, I had to get this up because it was set up. Can you turn okay. it down a little bit? Uh, yeah. So I love your content. Thanks, man. You ever done a podcast? You know what? I, I, I've done a couple, but I actually filmed my first one yesterday. Well, tell me about it. How was your experience? It was pretty cool. I um I put on my Instagram story maybe a couple of weeks ago, just an idea I thought of. It was basically almost like a Dave Ramsey style, you know, kind of advice, kind of review what you got going on. If you bought a car within the last 60 to 40 or 45 to 60 days, and I had a kid come on who just bought a car like a week ago, and I just kind of, we talked about the warranty he bought, the interest rate he got, the price he paid for the car, the trade in value. He ordered the car. We talked about that and just the whole process. He got a pretty good deal. So there was nothing, it wasn't super exciting because, you know, I got a couple people with bad deals lined up. Those will be more fun to hammer them. Like what the, <laughs> what the heck were you thinking? But his was pretty straightforward. He got a pretty good deal on a Camaro he ordered. Awesome. So do you sell other cars besides Lincolns or just Lincolns? I sell just Lincolns, but okay. I feel like I know the industry well enough to research and tell you if you got a good deal or not. Absolutely. Well, perfect. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast. It means a lot to me. And hopefully we can share with the world um, who you are. Why do you do what you do? Um, tell me a little bit about um, you growing up. I kind of stalked you a little bit in the essence of uh, Facebook just to see where you're from. It showed that you grew up in Pennsylvania. How was your childhood? What? Um, how did you become you? I mean, my, my childhood, I look back, was pretty solid. I did have a um, drug addict father who wasn't always in the picture, divorced parents, house foreclosed closed on, lived with grandma a little bit, lived with mom a little bit, lived with the other grandma a little bit. Dad came back in the picture. Dad left the picture back with grandma. But ultimately, I never, ever felt resentment towards anybody, towards my dad, towards my mom, towards anything that happened. You know, I tell stories to my wife and she's like, I can't believe that happened to you. And I'm like, I, I, I had two brothers. I have three brothers now, but I had two brothers I grew up with. And we just always kind of took care of each other, looked after each other. And I just always had a fun childhood. I've always been a uh, I've always just been a guy who woke up in a good mood. You know, I'm really not a cranky guy. It's, it's, something's really wrong if I'm in a bad mood. So I've always had the ener high energy levels, always been in a good mood. And I think that really just easily translated into sales because I'm I'm a very consistent person. I show up. Awesome. You know, I might not be the world's hardest worker. Definitely not the worst worker. I'm very, very consistent. When it comes <laughs> to my personality, my work ethic and what to expect from me. OK, well, then that means you're consistent, I would say. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and you said you got three brothers. So are they also in the car business or what do they do? Yeah. So actually, I was the first one in the car business. I started selling cars in high school. I would leave after fourth period, my senior year of high school, and I would go to the, the car dealership I currently work at. It was kind of like a work release program. If you had a legitimate job, the principal would let you leave. So I was actually washing cars at the, the dealership. And I had no desire to sell cars. I thought I could be good at it, but I really just didn't want to. I was just going to do the typical college, business degree, whatever, life not figured out, you know, route. And my manager, who's like a father to me now, uh, my our general manager, he said, look, if you're going to leave school to come, it's not going to be to wash cars. It's going to be to sell them. You're going to at least learn a skill. Whether you want to do it after high school or not, it's up to you but I'm not letting you leave school early just to come clean cars and goof off. So I was like, all right, I really want to leave school. So if I got to sell cars, <laughs> you know, and I ended up being pretty good at it in high school. And after about two years of doing it, my older brother, you know, you never want to flex money. That's not never my intention, but yeah, you know, I said, Hey, I made this much last year. What? And he was working at national tire and battery, like 65 hours a week, 70 hours a week as a manager there and make, making decent money, nothing to brag about. And I was like, dude, I work like 45, maybe 50 hours a week. I mean, there's guys who do more in the business. Our dealership doesn't make us work that long. I, I have worked a 60-hour week. I've worked a 70-hour week. But for the most part, it's 45, 50. He goes, dude, I'm signing up. And I was like, you might take a pay cut. you know. And, just, and my brother sells Cadillac, actually, coincidentally enough. And he's killing it, man. He absolutely crushed it. And my younger brother, the guy behind the camera in 90% of my videos, just got promoted to the finance manager at the dealership I work at. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So we're all, my mm -hmm. other brother's eight years old. So he's not, he's not in the car business yet. 
So what made you start doing videos? So it all started probably with the new Lincoln Aviator. It was like mm -hmm. the first real video I wanted to make. And I was like looking reviews. I couldn't find any reviews on it. I was super excited. I'm like a, I love Lincoln, man. That's just what I really like. And I was like, I want to see videos on this. And there was no real good reviews on it. There was a couple from the auto show, but no one had their hands on the car. Right. And our trainer came up, you know, from Lincoln, came to our dealership. And I was like, dude, why don't I just make a video? It'll have to do well. I mean, nobody's made like a, a walk around, sit in the car, smell the car, feel the car, touch the car video. So I made that video. This is probably 2019. I make this video. And it does okay on YouTube. I think got a hundred thousand views in a couple months. Like that was super. So I'm like, I'm hooked. Oh man, I'm getting views. People are watching. Gotta do more videos, more Lincoln content, more Lincoln content. And I kind of didn't even go full fledged hard into it for the first couple years. Maybe those first three years, I'd make a video a month, every other month, go a couple months with no videos. And then I started to get put on TikTok a little bit, and that was still kind of car review esque. Then I started doing car sales advice and we're talking five, sub 5,000 followers, you know, probably a year and a half ago, sub 5,000 followers. The car sales advice gets a little bit of traction. Then I seen some other guys. I don't know if you ever heard of Abe the goat. I have. I seen him do a couple funny videos and I was like, huh, I could do that. Now these funny videos that he was doing at the time and that I started doing, in my opinion, were like car salesmen would find them funny. Maybe not the general public would understand them. But I make a couple videos like that. They're doing okay. I maybe have 10,000 followers at this point, 15,000 followers. Then I made a video. I'll never forget. I was just talking about the other day. It was when the customer knows more than you. And I just pretended to be like a rude customer that just knew more than everybody. Get away from Give me your best price. Don't tell me about the car. Because anyone who's bought a car can probably relate to that. So, you know, Absolutely. the seller knowing anything, me knowing everything. Boom, video a million hits overnight, basically. And I, it clicked. I was like, I got to make videos that everyone can find funny. You don't have to be in the car business to probably find most of my videos funny. And that's just kind of the content I've rolled with. I still th throw a couple out there that are for the car sales guys. Right. But for the most part, I try to, and it kind of goes back to sales in general, keep it simple. You know, I try to keep all my videos simple. I might use terms that aren't car sales correct you know like when i talk about a lease rate guys are like well that's a money factor i know it's a money factor i know i'm just trying to keep it keep simple, simple. Yeah, absolutely it, yeah so your first video got over a hundred thousand views and then you didn't take it serious in the aspect of keep producing the content and then your other one just took off and it was that simple yeah so i mean i was 2019 i did the aviator review and and although I love Lincoln, it, at the time, I wasn't thinking like, I was thinking quality over quantity, not quantity over quality. So I was like, dude, nobody wants a Lincoln MKZ review. Nobody cares about a Continental. They're all out there. I got lucky with this Aviator video. I had the only one. I was the first one to do it. It was a lucky video. That's my thought process 2019 as a 20-year-old, 20 21-year-old at the time. Um and then we got like the new navigator and I do the new navigator review and we get the, you know, anytime we got like a brand new, fresh off the line, no one's really, I would do those videos. And I just didn't really take the content seriously for a couple of years. I, I'd do a couple how to videos that never got many views, like how to hook up your Bluetooth on a Lincoln, you know, sync three, if you're familiar, you know, that, that, that type yeah. of software. And did that, that do good? It did. Okay. I mean, Nothing crazy. You know, maybe if I checked right now, I might have 10,000, 20,000 views. But the TikTok is what really changed the game for me. And it was, I was actually, and it's just funny how people think, you know, I was almost, I don't want to say embarrassed. Embarrassed isn't the word, but I wasn't even posting my TikTok videos on my Instagram because I started my TikTok from the ground up. Didn't really even tell anybody, you know, people I worked with knew, but I didn't tell any of my friends. And I was like, I don't want to post this on my Instagram. That's my personal page. What are what are all the kids I went to high school with going to think? I'm making these funny videos, kind of embarrassing myself. And then I one day I was like, screw it. And then my tech, my Instagram probably eight months ago had 3,000 followers. And I think I had 160,000 today. Maybe That's what I was about to say. You have 253.9 on TikTok. You have 165. So you got 420,000 followers um, you got 18 million likes just on TikTok. You got 18.4 million views. 
I mean, that is amazing. That's just in three videos, by the way. So <laughs> that is absolutely amazing. That's why uh, I've seen your videos for probably three years, and I, it, it always hooks me and just draws me in. And that's why I was like, that's 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 incredible. So that's why I wanted to reach out to you. Thank you so much for sharing that as well. Um, so you talked about your childhood. Uh, what do you dislike or like about the car industry? I know me personally, the one thing that I didn't like is just the hours. You've touched on that in the sense of you worked about 45 hours a week. Is there any other things that you dislike? Is there some things that you absolutely love about the car business? Share about that. I mean, so I'm in a super lucky position and I really didn't even realize how bad the car business truly was until maybe this last year and a half. Cause I, you know, my dealership is like fairy tale and I tell, it's really true. I mean, we truly help people. Nobody gets ripped off. We don't play games. We don't false advertise all the videos I make that I'm doing in those videos. We just truly don't do. I work for a standalone family owned Lincoln dealership kind of outside the ghetto in a way. So, I mean, we're working to get our deals. You know, we're not in Tampa Bay, Florida, where it's MSRP, get out. You know, we work with people. We have a very um, great reputation in the area. A lot of our clients come back to see us and we work with people. You know, we have people coming out of leases that are paying 500 bucks a month. And, you know, if we sell them at full pop, it's 800 bucks a month. But Mr. Biondi, you know, if you've bought cars here, we're giving you the car. That's how he, that's his philosophy. If you've been doing business here since my dad started this 60 years ago, we're going to give you away a car to get the payment. Got to make some money in there, of course. You know, I'm saying we're losing money selling cars. But so, I mean, where I work, that's what I really like is how involved the ownership is to continue to maintain clientele. Yeah. But I get, and this is more of a personal thing I don't like about the car business on my dealership. When you have, one uh, one store, one family involved. There's always this crazy idea. Let's change it real quick. Let's 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 implement this new idea. Where I feel like if you're at a store that has 50 dealerships, you know those processes and procedures are a little bit smoother run than maybe you'd see at my dealership. And they don't just change things one month. Oh, it didn't work. Change back. You know, maybe I'm wrong. I've never. I've only worked at one dealership. So you all probably retain customers at an extremely high level if you. If your business model is set up that way, where if they buy there one time, you always take care of them. Is that right? Yeah, I don't have the numbers, but I mean, my my lease return rate is ridiculously high. Well, perfect. How many cars do you personally sell a month? Um. So last last year was a good year for me. I I really ended the year really really bad. Um, did thirteen last month? A shame to say, just a just a rough month. I'm not an excuse maker, but was sick at the beginning of the month and couldn't seem to get things back on track. But I averaged eighteen point seven cars last year. Damn, good job! Congrats. Thank you. I had a I had a couple near thirty car months. I think it was like the, I started the I started the year on fire, dude. I was like, I'm gonna average thirty cars this year. I was like, <laughs> it was like twenty six, twenty eight, twenty four. Kind of dwindled off back to that lower 20, some upper teens. I think last month was actually my worst month. Um, but, you know, and I'm, I'm not an excuse maker. I, this is the, the world I live in, but I work at a standalone Lincoln dealer. So it's like, I don't afford to sell. I'm just Lincolns. I'm selling a lot of new Lincolns. A lot of, do y'all sell primarily new or used? Primarily new. Primarily new. We have a used car inventory. We will keep nice trades. Um, the business at my dealership has changed since I first started. We were an extremely volume-based used car dealer that sold new Lincolns when I first started. I'm talking 200 used cars on the ground, 150 of them from Enterprise. You know, we'd have 25 Hyundai Sonatas for 14.9. You know, and it was a crazy business at the time. That you know that that's dried up. There's not that you can't really do that. You know, Enterprise seems to sell a lot of their nice cars. The only ones they want to sell are the crappy ones, you know, with bullet holes in them. <laughs> so, but, uh, go ahead. How many do they sell per month? And do you want to say the name of your company? I know you said the name of the owner. Do you want to promote that and throw that out yeah, there? Yeah, I, well? I work at Beyondy Lincoln in Monroeville, right outside Pittsburgh. We've been there for over 55 years at that exact location. Perfect. And do you get a lot of customers from your videos? That was a question that I was very interested in. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would honestly say not a ton of people I don't know. 
I get some people who reach out, but once again, I'm selling new Lincoln. So it's a limited clientele. It's not like I work at a mega center where it's, I got Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, Toyota, Subaru, Honda, Lexus, all in one. I'm working with just Lincolns. Definitely have generated some sales. Really helps with the repeats. I get a, a lot of my customers follow me. You know what I mean? So it's like that I'm always on their mind. So instead of sending them that 90 day email and that, that follow up, because we all know salesmen suck at follow up. I Most am, of them do. I'm, I'm in that group. But, and I do some things, maybe we'll talk about later. I do some things that most guys don't do. But the social media is the ultimate follow up. I'm always in front of them. I get DMs like, oh, bro, just saw your video, by the way. Need a new car. Oh, just saw your video. I was just, I was showing this to my grandma. I, you know, and then, you know, I get a lot of repeats and referrals from people I already know. I wouldn't say there's a ton of people from like three states over, like, I'm coming to you to buy a Lincoln. It's happened. A lot of people just come say hi to me, actually. That's kind of a weird you part. You noticed a lot in public? Yeah. I mean, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, I don't even, I'm not that guy. I don't want to, it's like, I don't mind it at all. It's super all cool. Right. It's super humbling. I'm a pretty low key guy kind of. I mean, if you know me and you're my friend, I'm like on the, up. you know, I'm always moving, talking, but you know, like I go to the, I was at the steel game. I had like four people want to like take a picture of me and it's just like something I'm not used to. So what happens? Do you take pictures with them? Oh, absolutely, dude. I'll no matter where I am in life, how famous or not famous, I will always take the time to somebody who appreciates the work I put out. I would never be that guy. Dude, I'm at the steward game, leave me alone. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's amazing. I I, I can't even believe they want a picture with me. You know, what I mean, that's how I'm thinking. <laughs> I mean, we can get a picture if you really want one. I'm just I'm just a funny guy on TikTok and you know, with some with some educational stuff as well. Yeah. So when you started, you said that you were washing cars and then you went right into selling cars. Were you successful when you started or how was that? I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to say I was like crazy successful, but I never had like trouble like selling 10 cars a month in high school. Yeah. You know, what I mean, at a dealership where the average salesman was selling 10 cars a month. I mean, you had your guy, I mean, you're in the business, you know, yeah, you, you have a couple guys that do the the plus 15 and 20. And then most of your pack is probably doing eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 cars. Yeah. And my first year out of high school, uh, I think my best month was December of like, I, so I graduated high school in May. Uh, I probably averaged nine cars while in high school. And then that summer I did really good. I don't remember the numbers exactly. Um, and then I think I finished December. I'll just remember it being a life-changing month because I sold like 20 cars that December. Damn. Heck yeah. How did that make you feel? Yeah, uh, really good. Really good. It was funny because then I always tell people about this. And this is why I'm like, people look at me as a frugal guy. It is a whole different conversation, but I, I don't spend money on myself, but I'm I heavily invest real estate, stocks, da, 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 that doesn't really matter. But I'm always spending a ton of money. But it doesn't reflect on like my per like it's not a material purchase. You know, I'm not gonna be rocking a eight hundred dollar car payment and I'm not buying a super nice primary home and I'm not going out to these fancy dinners. So when people are like, Russ, I know you make money, why don't you spend it? I'm like, Oh, I spend it. Just you don't see it. But I bought my first house before that December and I was tweaking. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I just bought a house, I got a mortgage. So that December I went really hard selling cars. And that's where I was like, dude, the more responsibility you take on i think in sales the harder you're going to work when you have that flame to your butt like you know and i would say i would like some guys like go make a go get a 1500 dollars car payment you'll make it back i mean that that sure that's a strategy but i try to do it with investments you know what i mean like almost over leverage myself in investing so i have to make it back in car sales what's your best investment what do you like investing in <laughs> well probably real <laughs> estate I just closed. I'm closing on my uh, fourth property. Um, this is actually this property I'm sitting in right now is an investment property of mine. My cameraman, brother, finance manager actually lives in a duplex I own. And because I'm buying another property and moving soon, uh, we set up the podcast room in his house just for the time being. My house hack has been buy a very humble home, move into it, get preferred terms on the financing and the down payment live in it for a year or two and move out, rinse and repeat. And I'll, I'll do that until I have a family and kids that I probably want to settle down. But my wife's on board. 
But you know, it's it's funny because you asked my best investment, and I didn't even know if we we're gonna get into this, but TikTok actually has been my best investment of my time. I haven't put much money into it, but I put a lot of time. I mean, if you see the videos, I mean, they don't take a whole lot of time to make. My brother and I have a really good flow. Most videos you see are two to three takes, non-scripted, just an idea. He knows what to say. I know what to say. We're both in the business. But um, TikTok has a creator program that pays a lot of money if you get a lot of views. And I, I have recently over these last six months been about doubling my car sales income off TikTok. Do you want to say how much that is? What do you make off TikTok? It, it varies and it, it could change at any time. And so, I mean, this this is just what it's been. I, I get the payment the last six months. I don't even believe it. But it's been around between seventeen and $25,000 every month. Super happy for you. Congratulations. Uh, thank you, man. It's amazing. And it's like... <laughs> It's just a blessing because I've been doing it for free for a while. So it's like I just try to always keep that mentality. And, and there's a lot of hard work that's went into it. Luckily, at my dealership, one of the because some people are like, well, why do you why do you still work as your dealer? Maybe you go somewhere else. I mean, I love where I work, but they're they let me go in and film on on my day off. They let me stay late and film. Days were closed, I go in and make videos. So there's just like so much flexibility on their end because they really support what I'm doing, you know. And you mentioned that your general manager is the one that said you're not going to wash cars. If you're going to come here, and I really like that, you got to respect that. And he's still the same general manager. Yeah, you know, I I call him my uncle Jimmy. Not really my uncle, but that's what I call him. And me and him just have a bond like no other. I mean, I'm I'm friends with his kids. We went to high school. And I love his kids, but I mean, I'm they've gone on their own path, and I've stayed at the dealership. And I'm, you know, he's like one of my best friends. You know, he's twice my age, but he really is probably my best friend. He uh he spoke for at my wedding reception, you know, he had a little speech and stuff. So we're super tight. It's just it's just a bond, man. It's almost like a it's like a second dad. Well, congratulations. There's always good having a mentor or someone push you and give you good advice. And like, you know, if you, you could have been washing cars still or you could have went a different direction. So having that person uh kind of push you into the car sales, that's awesome. So congratulations. And he's done a lot for me in terms of like you know, you meet people in the business and this isn't to toot my own horn, but they know nothing about the business that like my, my older brother's been selling cars for about four years. He doesn't know the back end. He doesn't know how the profit works. He doesn't even know what like a, a service absorption rate is. My general manager has almost treated me like his son and I'm learning things that a typical salesman wouldn't know finance reserve, all this stuff that a sales guy's normally kept in the dark about. Absolutely. I could probably say I know almost every area of the business. He lets me appraise trades, buy cars. When he's not there, I'm almost in charge in terms of TO and deals, desk and deals. They've asked me to be manager. I don't want to do it. I'm, I don't want to be manager. But he's almost trained me like a manager because he's like, dude, why wouldn't you want to know this stuff? So are you going to be an owner one day? Maybe. You never know. I mean, a lot of, you know, I'm probably in a financial position right now where if I really wanted to, I could start my own little used car lot. I don't know if that's something that interests me. I think I'm a franchise guy. Um, and that's a lot of money to get into these days. You know, you can't you can't go buy a franchise with two, three hundred grand cash and get a loan like you maybe could 20 years ago. I mean, you got you're talking millions, even for a even for a franchise that's like underperforming losing money, you still need millions. When you speak about Appraising your own trades, I watched one video of yours where you had it for months and months because you put too much money into it. Yeah. What about that one? Okay, so we all make mistakes. <laughs> and I needed a deal. So this was um, this was like two years ago. And this is why customers are liars. Sweet old How guy. How nice it is. <laughs> yeah. And he, he said, hey, you know what? Someone kind of swiped me a little bit. It's a little scratch. The door's open. It's not a huge deal. And I I can't remember the figures. You know, if you watch the video, I mean, it was a $500,000 car max. The miles on it wasn't bad. It was like a 2011 Mitsubishi Gallant uh -huh. with like 97,000 miles. And I'm thinking, you know, this car's worth two grand. And he's like, well, Russ, I just, I just got it inspected. I just put three grand into it. He had a receipt for three grand. So I, that was true. And I'm thinking, okay, how bad could it be if the dude just spent three grand to get it inspected? Tires, brakes, motor mounts, whatever. So I'm thinking, okay, if he spent three grand on this car, got to be worth three grand. 
We get it approved, barely approved. We needed the three grand with his money. I had to squeeze him for some money down. And he pulls up the next day with this car. And my manager's still off. And this is probably why you shouldn't always have salesmen appraising trades. And I was young at the time, so it was not the right decision. But I was like, ah, screw it. We're, we're making this deal. <laughs> <laughs> what did he buy? A uh, navigator, actually. Uh, like a two-year-old navigator. It was like probably 70,000 miles at the time. Good guy. I mean, he came in for service a ton. I'd always tell him this. I told him the story straight up. You know what I mean? I was like, you're lucky I was in charge that day. I was a thousand dollar car. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, the, so what advice would you give other salespeople, uh, new people, people that's been in the industry? What has made you so successful? Um, two things. A couple of things. I don't even want to say one thing or the other. Patience and consistency. So patience, look, you could have joined the car industry in 2020 and made $100,000. I think that's every normal guy's goal. I want to be a six-figure earner. I think that's a normal guy with any ambition with, that, that hasn't made six figures. I want to make six figures. In 2020, you could have been a warm body that didn't even know how to talk. Probably could have got close to that. That's not how it normally is. That's not how it will always be. Correct. I started in car sales in 2016, 2017. Um, now I'm lucky because I was in a position where I didn't really care about how much money I made. I, I was always money motivated, but sometimes when you get into car sales, it takes a little bit of time to get it rolling. You got, almost got to be patient with your dealership, get on that lease cycle, you know, because the third year when those lease customers are coming back, that's where I say patience that's where it makes a big difference. Then, then the consistency is just taking customers, doing your follow-up calls, getting people back in the store, always promoting. Those two things combined will make you a well above average car salesman, just consistency and patience. The skills, the being a master negotiator, all that stuff is gravy on top. But at any dealership, in any position, any area, any market with consistency and patience, I really don't think you could go wrong. I think you would do very well in your career. Do you think sales is for everybody? No, I don't. I mean, some people will say, yeah. Some people just aren't salespeople. I mean, I've seen them hired. I've tried to train them. Some dudes just can't even have a conversation. And I don't know if that's, you know, when you're trying to teach a 22-year-old how to just have like a conversation like we're having now. And they, you know, that's okay. I could probably never be a mechanic. I could probably never be an accountant. My, You could work with me for the next 10 years. I could probably never be an accountant. I have severe ADHD and a pretty bad, you know, attention to detail. Just something I could probably never do. All right. What are your dreams? What are your goals? What are you, are you going to keep selling cars for a long time? That You mentioned that you started when you're in high school and that means you're probably about 18. You've been doing it since 16. So it's seven years. So you're about 25 years old. Yeah. I mean, I have no desire to leave the car business. I have no desire to quit what I'm doing. Like I said, the social media has kind of taken off. That's been a great income earner. Things like that. I I, I am striving to make it even more in a in, in more of an abundance of that money. But things change. You know, you see social media influencers fall off and things change. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm planted in the car business. I'm planted where I'm at. Um, you know, if, if a dream would maybe be buying my dealership, I don't know if I'd want to own just a single standalone Lincoln dealer. I think that's always just like an addition to a nice portfolio of dealerships, but you do have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's pretty tough to get into them. I and mean, you know, I mean, getting in, cracking into the franchise car dealership industry is very tough. A lot yes. of money involved. It's not impossible though. But, uh, you know, my my true dream would probably take the content creation as far as I can. Just Have you ever honest. tried to make videos outside of the car industry? No, I mean, if I got famous for content creation, it, it would all be car related. I, I love cars. So I don't think I'd ever take it too far outside of cars and maybe do a little real estate because that's also what I'm into. It's probably my second love. But those are the only two things I'm good at, cars and real estate. What do you drive? So I've had 11 cars in the last five years. <laughs> I'm always getting something new. I'm always making money on my cars. And as I mentioned, I usually drive a humble car. Right. Um, currently, I'm driving a 2023 Ford Maverick. You familiar with it? I sold Fords. Very familiar with them. 
So I saw about a year ago, we trade, here's what, here's how it happened. We traded one for like seven grand over MSRP customer, you know, and that my manager like, look, that's what market value is. That's what we got to give. If we want to make the deal, that's what we got to give the guy because that's what they're worth. I'm like, that's crazy. You know, and then we sold it in like three days for 10 grand over MSRP. You, <laughs> I'm like, this is crazy. So this is about, a, this is probably last, this would have been like May of 22, mm -hmm. May of 22. So my brother, as I mentioned, works at a Cadillac dealer, but he works at it. My brother works for, I wouldn't say conglomerate, but they own like 12 dealerships. So I call him and say, hey, I need a favor. Can you get your guys at the Ford store to order me a Maverick at employee pricing? I work for Lincoln. He goes, I doubt it, dude. I go, just tell him. And I said, I, I'm not the type of guy to pull this car, but maybe in return, I could do like a shout out video. And my social media wasn't even this popping at the time. So I'm surprised they did it, you know? And they're like, they'll do it because you're my brother. So I'm like, all right, cool. I'll order this Maverick and I'll just flip it. So at that time, I was driving a 2009 Hyundai Sonata with 170,000 miles that I paid like a thousand bucks for. That blew up. I bought an 03 Honda Accord for like two grand. Someone offered me like 3,800. So I sold that. Didn't have a car for like a month. I just drove a demo. I do kind of get a demo at my dealership. You know, they just, they don't care. They're pretty cool about it. Then I bought, and actually one of my favorite cars I ever owned, I bought a 2009 Kia Sedona minivan. <laughs> With no kids. No kids, just dogs, man. I put <laughs> all the seats out and I would just shuffle my dogs around. I loved it. And then my Maverick came in. I actually gave my minivan to my dog trainer just as a thank you because he always watched my dogs and took care of them. So I gave that to him. And I've been driving that since. I actually just bought a 2001 Mercury Grand Marquis for $1,000. It's a part of a content idea I have. I'm actually going to give it away. And my thought process is I'm going to start with a $1,000 car, give it to somebody, and then buy a $2,000 car, give it to somebody three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way up to a hundred grand. That's awesome. Congrats. Are you promoting that at all? I've put a little sneak peek. I didn't, I'm waiting for the title to come in because although my dealership does support what I do, for whatever reason, they didn't want to partake in me giving a car away. So Any instead thoughts of why they just, he was just like, just do that on your own. I don't know. I guess he didn't want, cause I, my idea was like, I'd stand on the, we're on a pretty busy highway. You know, I mean, there's probably 30,000 cars drive by every day, maybe w way more. I'm just guessing. And I was going to stand on the street with a sign that said free car. And he was like, I don't just know, which I understand, whatever. And he was like, look, what if that car blows up? And I was like, well, I was, it's a free car. Like, <laughs> who would be mad? You know, but we just thought differently upon it. And I said, no problem, man. I'll, I'll just do it somewhere else. Yeah. And you so mentioned I'll, you got dogs. What kind of dogs do you have? I have a bull mastiff and a Siberian Husky. So I got a real big one and kind of a small one. They're good dogs. Lots of hair, lots of droll. It's kind of a mess, but I like them. Yeah. So you, you I've got a golden doodle. I love animals. I, uh, when I first moved out of my parents' house, when I was 20 years old, I had two Jack Russells, best dogs ever. Then I end up getting a Whippet, which is like a mini Greyhound. I know super what fast is. dogs. Yeah, yeah. Awesome dogs. And then I got a golden retriever and they were all, I adopted them. They were super old. So they probably lived with us for about four years and they end up getting, one got cancer. One ended up getting like a bad, bad disease where his bones were just, or her bones were just deteriorating. Mm -hmm. So we had to put both down and then we ended up getting a golden doodle. Uh, golden doodle because they don't shed and they're just very good with kids and we got a one, I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old, so um, they're just very good with them. They're not rambunctious. They don't knock them down, so that's why we went with the Golden Doodle. What's your Golden Doodle's name? It is Murphy. Okay. You know, one of my most uh, viewed videos is I, uh, and then there's a funny story behind this. It kind of, I got in a little trouble. Uh, I did the customer who only cares about their dog. So I end up, I, you got to watch it again, but I pretend to be this customer like, well, there's not enough room for my golden doodle in the back seat. So you got to show me something else. And it's a, it's a, it's a whole video, but the dog was a golden doodle. And these customers that were there the day before, and I was off this day. So, and it's a huge coincidence. They'll never believe me. I'll swear to the day I die. I did not know this, but my really good friend was with these folks the day before who had a golden doodle. 
that apparently kept complaining that the cars weren't good enough for their dog. And I swear on my mom's grave, I did not know this. So I make my video. And me and my, you can ask my brother, 10 seconds before we film, I go, because we had the whole video planned out. I've been planning this for months. I could show you on my phone. I have so many video ideas. And I'll just pluck and pick what I want to do. And I say, hey, what, what should we do today? We're looking, he goes, let's do the dog video. That's a good one. We, we keep pushing that. Okay, let's go. We're, we're about to film the dog video. I go, what kind of dog should it be? He goes, mm, golden doodles. That's a pretty popular dog. We do it on a golden doodle. Like four hours later, because this, this video got like 3 million views in like a couple hours. It really blew up. She, this, la this lady's husband's like calling really mad at me and our dealership for making fun of them. And I'm like, making fun of who? What are you, like, what are you talking about? And my brother who kind of, kind of talked to them was like, we, that wasn't about you. And they didn't believe us. And it was like, I got my, my boss was a little mad, you know, I swear I did not make fun of them folks. If they ever hear this video, I apologize for the misunderstanding, but I'll take it to the grave. I was not making fun of them. That was just a huge, it was a really bad timing miss coincidence but my buddy who even waited on them was like yeah dude i didn't even tell you they had a golden doodle like how would you have known yeah like i didn't even know they had a dog i didn't even know who they were you know what i mean it was just like <laughs> but sometimes the videos get me in a little heat you know because not everyone finds them funny how do you come up with your ideas that uh, you just brought that up you got all kinds of ideas how do you come up with ideas um I don't, i'm just creative you know some of them are based on true events that dog one was not some of them are based on true events some of them are based on crazy scenarios i make up in my head you know sometimes people dm me with ideas sometimes guys i work with give me ideas sometimes service advisors like my service advisor just gave me an idea i didn't even come up with it yet he goes hey because they all watch my stuff they're like hey russ got an idea the i just had a customer who wouldn't take a loaner because we didn't have a black one for him and he said, well, I bought a black car, so I, you guys have to give me a black car in return. And I'm going to do a video on it. Like the, the, the customer who's picky with their loaner car. You know, and I'll, I'll expand on it, and there'll be more to it than just that. But, like, that's a, that's a pretty funny idea. That's a real-life scenario. Somebody wouldn't – brought a car in for an oil change, wouldn't do the oil change, and left because we didn't have a black loaner for them. Like, people are, people are freaking crazy, man. And you know this. So I, I do. I've um, me personally, I would always um, just to kind of talk about my experience in car sales. First month ever, I worked half a month, sold about twenty cars. Um, my best month ever, sold about sixty four and a half cars. Oh wow! Uh, Congrats. That's crazy. So thank you. So thank I worked you. up where I had a uh, an assistant. I worked up where I had two assistants. So I've been very successful in selling cars. Um, it's very rewarding, but as I mentioned before, the one downside is is just the time that it takes because I'd always work 70, 75 hours a week, sometimes 80. Mm -hmm. So that was the downside, but the positive side was I sold a ton of cars, made a lot of money, uh, enjoyed it, and it, you know, it, it's just a very – selling something is very – where you get pumped up and your adrenaline gets going. You're, you know, it's – I love sales, so absolutely. So what about what your you tech? Selling sixty four cars a month at like what kind of dealer? Volkswagen in Southern Indiana, which is not a popular brand around here at all. You see more Toyotas, you see more Hondas. Uh, we have a Ford, two Ford plants, so a ton of people sell Fords. A plan, uh, ton, yeah. So uh, Volkswagen's not very popular at all. So that's what I sold um, probably the most of. I was there for four years, sold a ton of Volkswagens. And I know why you did, and, and I'm telling you, and I, this is super respectful, but the only reason I did this podcast is because I like the way you talk. Elaborate. Please share more. <laughs> I said it to my wife. She's like, what do you mean? I was like, I don't know. He's a smooth talker. I've seen your one video that got a couple million hits. I just liked the way your voice sounded. It hit my ears, and I instantly liked you. I don't know what it is. I'm a weird guy. I'm a little different. But I'm like, I was like, I like this guy. She's like, you don't know him. I go, I like him. I like his voice. I like him. He's a smooth talker. He sounds very genuine. You can tell when a sales guy's complimenting people just to like, you know, get a sale. And there's guys who's probably just a really nice guy. And your southern soft spoken voice, I just really liked it, you know. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, you know, I do it to be different. I um Something that I've done for 21 years, when someone asks me how I'm doing, I say every day is a blessing. 
and it just throws people off their track. They very much enjoy it. Um, so I just try to be different and I try to be humble, try to be respectful, just try to give people a very good experience like your family dealership does. And people keep coming back. And, you know, I, um, I'd always at least sell, you know, a good percentage of people that I helped get a vehicle and they'd send me a ton of referrals. And I just, it was a snowball effect. Just treat people the right way and they reward you. And I'm, I'm a huge believer in it. So when you're selling 64 cars a month, I mean, that's impressive. I mean, my best month, well, there's, there's two best months. My best month was like 33, 34. I was just crazy, craziness. And then I did like 40 something one month, but it was during COVID. Our doors were closed. I was the I was just being my general manager. And we were like opening doors, throwing paperwork at people, throwing keys. And he was selling them. I was selling them. We sold like 60 cars. I got like 40 some punch in my name. We didn't really keep good track of anything. I mean, but I got paid on 40 some cars. So, you know, it all worked out. And then, and then we, that was like one month we were like closed, opened. I don't know if it was like that in Indiana. We were like closed, but open. I don't know. This is a super crazy time, but 34 on my own, no assistant. I, I mean, even with assistance, I can imagine 64 could be chaotic. Chaotic, uh, a lot of time, a lot of very time consuming where I would sell the cars, get the commitment some days, you know, my best day ever sold eight cars in one day. And it's a lot of working with the people. And once they say yes, uh, my assistant, John Hunt, would literally kind of wrap it up for me where I would go to somebody else. Um, I'm very good at multitasking. So um, you mentioned you're also very creative. So my brain just spacing out the appointments properly so you don't have to split deals very important as well so a lot of just just fumbling people just uh, juggling them in a good way of course now feel free to answer feel free not to how were your assistants paid the dealer if i sold enough cars the dealership paid for them because that was our agreement where i always performed i've were very rarely ever had a bad month because i've worked a ton and you know I'm a very humble individual, but I'm very good at sales as well. So worst month was probably 30 cars. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, they paid for them all. Uh, they'd make, roughly speaking, John Hunt would make eight nine $9,000 a month. Most months, probably about eight k $7,500. And he would help me make a ton of phone calls. He would set appointments for me. He did not really do the closing aspect. He was more just getting them in. Uh, following up with people because I developed a internet process in which we would always sell about 12 to 18 percent every single month internet and that's very good in the car business you probably know so getting a lot of people in and then 70 to 80 percent of the people that got in front of me actually ended up buying a car so I'm a very I track numbers and that's how I kind of figure out what I need to improve in um, I was stuck at about 40 cars for a while, so I figured out I need to talk to more people. How do you do that? That's when I started using and leveraging social media like you do, and I'd get a ton of referrals. I would uh, When I sold a car, I would literally tag them, and then after that, you know, most people get 10, 15, 20 different people that say congratulations. I would then send them a message and send them a friend request, and I started selling a ton of referrals. People didn't even know that I was reaching out to their friends I'd still give them a referral check, all of that, a couple hundred bucks. So that's when I really started getting 50, 60 cars is mainly referrals, getting a lot of people that came back after the two-year or three-year lease. Mm -hmm. So that's when it really picked up. So absolutely. And you closed at 70, 80% people on in the store? Every single month. That's crazy. That's really good. That's really strong. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I always tracked how many lot ups I got. And then that's when I when I started running the Ford dealership, I had a game plan because I knew how many people that they put in their CRM as showroom ups. So I knew that they were closing at it, roughly speaking, the 30 percent. So I knew it was very easy to get to where I wanted to go. So that's why, you know, I had a game plan in my head when I took that position where I knew they could sell more cars. You just have to close more. So that's where I, you know, my first month there, um, they would always sell the month before I got there. They sold 50 something cars. My first month we sold 90. Second month we sold 100. And it was just because I tracked numbers and, you know, we killed it. We'd sell, um, roughly speaking, I think the second month there we sold right at 70%. And every month after that, it was over 70%. I hate when people come on the lot, no TOs, they just leave. And that was a big pet peeve of mine. So that's what I stressed to all of the people. Plus, we do a lot of training every day. One of your funny videos was Andy Elliott 
where you're like a guy coming back from Andy Elliott yeah. and you're doing push-ups on the car. I yeah. remember that one. Um, that so I sent all my people out to Andy Elliott. I've, um, I love reading. I love investing in myself. So for the past 20 years, I read two books at least a month. I, um, always listen to podcasts, even before podcasts, I listen to cassette tapes, CDs about other salespeople, just how to get better. And as you mentioned, my Southern draw, a lot of people like it. So, uh, they're like, Hey, I like that person. So, um, just, I, I'm a huge believer in making a friend, make a sale. And if you get people to like you, you are very much like that as well, where, um, you know, just the way you conduct yourself, I understand why you're very successful. No, I appreciate that. So, and I know this, maybe I'm interviewing you at this point, but I'm just interested. Go ahead. <laughs> you went from the Volkswagen to the Ford dealer as a general mm -hmm. manager. Mm -hmm. GSM or GM? So I'll, technically, they would not allow me to be the GM. The owner of the dealership, me and him were extremely close friends. So I was a, labeled a GSM, but I was the GM. He never came to the dealership maybe once a month or once a week, I should say. Um, so I was running the parts department. I was running the service department. I was doing all of that. So it was more acting GM, but label title GSM. Uh, I've never been the one about titles. Just pay me my money, pay me what I'm worth. And I'm I cool understand. with that. And I, 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 I can't speak on it, but I, under, I really understand where you're coming from in that re regards, you know, in a similar situation. Why did you go from Volkswagen, top salesman doing unheard of numbers, top 1% of car sales guys, nobody, you know, there's probably less than a thousand guys who could say they were averaging over 40 cars a month and you were a top touch of 50, 60. Why did you go to general manager? Was that because a pay cut for you? It was a huge pay cut. So on average, you know, like when I sold that 64, I made 46,000 that month. And on average, I'd probably make 30 something thousand just for most months consistently. Uh, when I was, took that job, I was making about 17, 18, $19,000. But me and the owner had an agreement not written down, just verbally, where if I would turn that dealership around, he would give me part ownership. And that never came about. Um, so that's why we kind of had a major disagreement. I parted ways in March the 7th of 2023. I uh, traveled the U.S., the, primarily the East Coast, for about six months, not knowing what I wanted to do. And even though I took a pay cut, Training those 10 salespeople, nine salespeople on average, it was so rewarding just helping them get better at sales. You know, I've helped probably hundreds of people sell over the phone, but I've never done that in uh, just training people at a dealership standpoint. And that was my first real taste of like every day uh, after the nine o'clock meeting, we would train with all of the salespeople. When someone didn't buy, I would always go in there and... I believe I'm a very good leader in the aspect of we just sit there and talk and get them to understand what I would have done differently and just teach them the right way to do things instead of so many managers just beat you up. And you've been at one dealership. They sound very nice, but a lot of other dealerships just just throw crap at you all day. And I've never manager. been that way. Yeah, I've, I've had that 1980s car sale guy. Where the F your customers go, throw something at you. I, I I did have that manager, one of the best trainers who helped train me to be, you know, I'm talking old, you might not even know what this is, APB selling, uh, Joe Verde selling. I mean, he trained yes. me on all that stuff. There's a lot of it's antiquated in some ways, but it can be super uh, useful and it implemented in my own style, of course, you know. Never like to say anything word for word how someone else says it, but I, I think that's what makes me good at sales and where I, I don't think everyone can do sales or, or, or effectively do sales. I can hear somebody do thing, do something one time and I can do it in terms of a sales tactic. What's your best sales tactic? What do you like doing? What, what suits you the best? So it really depends on the customer, but to answer your question, my favorite, and this has been probably over the last four or five months. I can't even remember his name. I was trying to find this guy. He's kind of blowing up on social media he does this sales, he does door-to-door -door sales and a lot of other sales, and he almost acts confused. And he told this story about how he door knocked to sell a roof and the customers would walk out, you know that the customers, the, the people who own the home would walk out. And instead of being like, hi, I'm Russ Richardson with ABC Roofing and I want to sell you a new roof, he would look at the roof with a pen and be like, um, excuse me, uh, you guys are the, and he wouldn't even look at him, you guys are the property owners of this house correct 
okay, okay. And I, and he would just not like confused, but knows what he's doing. And I do this a ton and it really works. I'll be like, let's say a customer says, Hey Russ, I want a black. This just happened like last week. This whole car. Hey Russ, I need a black car with black interior, Lincoln Nautilus, brand new. I know we don't have one, but I know we have one with brown interior. Now, if I say, would you do brown interior? And they say, no, I'm dead in the water. Okay. There, that, that didn't work. So I'll go, okay. Black Lincoln, black interior, 2023. Um, you know, I know I have one and I, look, I know it has brown interior and this is maybe where this is a little <laughs> fib, but it's like, I know I have one with black exterior, just the way you want it. I'm, I'm drawing a blank here. Let's go take a walk out to it. I know it has a dark interior. I think you're going to love it. Let's go take a walk out to it. You know, boom, show them the car. Oh, I actually like this brown interior. And I start selling the brown. Did it another time where a lady saying, you know, I'm really good at switching people. That's where like when we had the order cars, like that wasn't good for me. I'm like really good at selling now, not later. So like I did eventually figure out how to get people to order cars, but I'm really good at creating excitement now and switching people. Had a lady who wanted another interior and we didn't have it. And I, the only shot I had of selling her car was a car with a red interior. And she's like, I wouldn't consider anything else. So if I would just say, hey, would you do a red interior? Most people are going to say no. And I go, hey, I have this car. I don't even know if you'd consider it. Probably not. But it just looks so good with this white exterior. Would you please just take a quick peek at it for me? Maybe it's something you'd never consider. But I piqued her interest. Well, what is it? Come on, let me just show you. Boom, she buys that car. And I think this kind of laid back, confused a little bit sales tactic has really worked wonders for me. Just kidding. I have been hitting people with this a ton. I mean, I don't even know if you'd consider this. I don't even know if this would work. I don't even know if I can help you. I don't even know till we look where instead of, I know I can get your payment the lowest possible, you know, and I kind of probably did that for a while. And I, you know, there's different sales styles I do with different customers, but that's probably been my most favorite approach over these last couple months. It's just like, how are you going to be mean to somebody or this I feel like that takes the walls down where I'm just, you know, I take Absolutely. my glasses, the glasses are like a little bit of a prop, you know, I, you know, I don't even know if you'd consider this, you know, it's all about like the tone, body language, inflection. There's a lot of psychology to it, um, which is interesting because I was going to ask you about the Andy Elliott because I've talked to some of the guys down there. I am going to his training in April. I'm paying for it myself. My dealership's not sending me. Um, it seems and I've never been to his training. I've only watched videos. Seems like your style is completely different than his style. Mm -hmm. So did your guys come back from that training saying, hey, hey, Mr. Loveall, this is completely different than what you're teaching me? Or did it kind of go together? Or it was just like they learned some really good things and implement it in a different way? You know, I mean, how did that go sending your whole crew down there? I like hearing different voices. That's why I love reading books. Yeah. I love learning different styles, different closes, just like that guy um, speaking about it. When he taught you that technique, have you ever seen the movie Ten Men? No, I haven't. You need to watch it. It's just like that. Or that's what they that's that's the old style where people um, just like play that little look and like they point stuff out. And you you would really like that movie. I promise. Watch Ten it. Man, like T I N. T I N M E N, old school. Danny Glover, amazing. You, you would absolutely watch that. Love. Yeah. I, really, I think it suits my personality. I mean, I can definitely be, I'm really good at creating excitement too. But if I'm selling Lincolns and I got a 65 year old lady in front of me, you know, I'm, I, I'm, it's not going to be like, come on, follow me. Let's go. You know, I mean, I can do that. You know, I mean, if I get somebody young and it's like, let's create some excitement, maybe a, a young couple on a navigator. Hey, I don't want to waste any of your guys' time. Let's get straight to the point. Let me show you the car. We'll work up a great end of year deal. Let's get it done. And if you love the car, we'll make a deal right now. Like I can do that selling. But when I'm with the older clientele, I really like to just slow it down a little bit. Hey, there's no rush today, guys. You know, I just want to take our time, find a car that suits you perfectly. And at the end of the day, it's, and I love this Andy Elliott clothes. This is my, at the end of the day, it's your decision. So just give me a little bit of your time and we'll go inside, give you all the information you need to think about. Does that sound fair? I really like that clothes. I've never had somebody say no to that. Not once. No, because they want to get more information. It's a laid back approach. It's just more like, I'm going to help you. And a lot yeah. of people like getting help. So absolutely. So when I sent everybody down there, they would come back and every single one of them started working out. And then it lasted like two weeks. So uh, 
that was uh, pretty funny as well. But um, I recently started working out, helping my eating healthier because I got yeah. kids want to live longer. Um, so, but yes, we are completely different styles. Um, I'm more laid back. I am, you know, I like getting excitement, excitement as well, but I'm more relationship. I am more just getting people to like me. You just mentioned that you mirror the prospects. That's what I've always called it. Or my mentor taught me is, you know, if you get an owner person, you talk slower, newer person, a younger, you have to have the excitement guy that's buying a hundred thousand dollar car. He wants to get right to the point. So that's what you were talking about. So yeah. bravo to you. No, and that's what, you know, my one mean manager, and he came up in a business where you just bullied each other. You know, I hear stories of the 80s and 90s car sales. I mean, it was brutal. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like my managers tell this story, like a lady, they brought, hey, I got I got cash from my buyer. And the, you know, let the manager, be like, let me see that cash. And they'd rip it, like $100 bills. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you better go close this deal. Like crazy stuff. And I'm like, no <laughs> way that happened. They're like, no, like. We'd literally rip up like two hundred dollars cash. Like, you better go close this deal, or it's come. You know, like just crazy stuff. And that's I can see why car dealers could have a bad rep. Absolutely. What's the craziest experience you personally ever had at the dealership? Oh, there's a lot of them. Mm. Probably. I mean, it almost turned into a fist fight. Um, nice people, super nice, bought a town, or I'm sorry, a Lincoln MKZ, an old one, like a 2012 for like 10 grand cash, made it 10 grand out the door. They kept mentioning how they really wanted a town car, but that, you know, at the time I'm like, okay, well we have town cars. Yeah. We just happened to have a couple of used ones, which we never did, but happened that. And it was like 13,000 plus tax. So it would have been maybe four or five grand more make the deal on the Z and they keep complaining about the brakes. And there's like nothing wrong with the brakes. We look at the brakes, we analyze the brakes. He's saying it's going to the floor. We drive it. We we do it. We do a uh, a fluid or a brake flush or whatever, just to for some. And he just keep, keeps complaining. My general manager gets involved. He goes, "Hey, look, I'll make you a deal. I'll give you what you paid for your MKZ, straight up even." And I was here for this phone call, so I could see how there'd be a little misunderstanding. He said, "I'll give you what you paid for your car, even. You're not going to lose any money in your car, and you can buy any other car on the lot you want for the difference." Okay, we want the town car. He goes, no problem. I'll trade you out of your car even, and, and we can put you in the town car. They kind of came in thinking that we were just going to give them the $14,000 town car for the same price, no money. So I got everything ready. We're doing paperwork. And I'm like, all right, guys, total difference came to 40, whatever it was. And they this guy starts like screaming in my face. And luckily, my general manager is he's kind of like you. I, I, I can be a hothead. I'm like fist clenched, fist clenched, like ready to go. He came down, diffused the situation. We did kick him out, but he came down, diffused the situation, was like, look, just leave that. Like, look, he's ready to beat you up. He probably will. Just get out of here. <laughs> you know, that was probably the craziest thing. I mean, there's there's so many stories. Though. I mean, they can't think of a better one, but I'm sure there's one out there. What about you? Craziest story. I knew you were probably going to ask that once I asked that to you. Um We accidentally sold someone's Ford Maverick because it wasn't like in Ford system, you, you can pull it up and it's supposed to like, like, like pull up their name and everything. When we put it in, because we thought it was a pre-order where it was going to do that. It had the, uh, the, the green, I believe it was, it was like green or blue. And I think it was green. So green we knew on the it window was. sticker. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, we knew it was, but then it didn't populate in the system. So we ended up selling it. Ooh. And that gentleman, we posted it, the salesperson posted it, showing that it was sold, and we did not know it was actually to a customer. And he flipped out, wrote us a bad review, came in the dealership, flipped out, um, and it was just a terrible, terrible experience. Um, one other time, been. yeah, I would have been pissed too. And, you know, we, we didn't do it on purpose. It was just, it, it didn't populate. Like, it just, it was just bad luck or whatever you want to call it, just, it, it sucked. And um, we offered to order him another one. We offered him to do it and like sell it cheaper. We And he just was pissed. And then one other time, there was a huge guy. He ordered an F-350. And this individual came in and his code wouldn't work to get the discount because he worked at the Ford dealership because mm -hmm. a lot of people around here do. And then he started cussing the person out, the finance guy. And I'm a big treat people with respect. 
And I told him to get out. I'm not selling him the car. Uh, he ended up uh, taking us to court. Um, and they rolled it into his favor where we had to sell him the car. And the cops ended up coming in and making sure that it went smoothly. It absolutely sucked. But, you know, I just treat my people with respect and happy to do it. But we had a policy where you could not leave the car with the car if your code did not work because on a F350 it's probably eight nine thousand dollars off and yeah. if it didn't end up working we're not going to lose that money so the code didn't work we told him to come back the next day he came back the next day and i personally talked to him and he still was just cussing cussing and i said just leave so that was How a crazy that, one too. I thought you guys had the right of refusal though of any client. Is this a could you could you have taken that to any furtherness in the court system, or did you guys just drop it at that point? No, they. Uh, this is the good old boy system, and it was in Frankfurt. Uh, that is the capital of Kentucky. It's so many people out there that just know each other. He his brother, uh, the judge's brother, lived right next door to the guy, mm. talking about a conflict of interest. But they ruled in his favor. And the dealership just dropped it and said, so be it. So they ended up saying that we had to sell it for cheaper. So he saved more money and uh, we had to pay legal fees and all of that stuff. And it, it absolutely sucked. But um, that was a very bad, bad experience um, that I could avoid it if I just ate crap. And uh, that's just not me. Like you said, that customer kind of went at you. You was ready to get down. Uh, just treat people with respect. He cussed out my finance guy. My finance guy is a good guy. Um, I came in there, he cussed at me, just get out. And he, he didn't, he got out, but he went and got, you know, the powers to be to help him. So that was a terrible experience. No, I just, you know, the, the stories pop in your head as you, as you talk. And I, I want your opinion on this one, because I actually made a tech talk on it and I got a lot of conflicting interests and every state's different. Um, in the state of Pennsylvania, it is the customer's responsibility to add their new vehicle to their insurance. Most car dealerships say, Hey, we'll call for you. That's what we do at my dealership. You know, I usually have that conversation. I'd say, hey, Mr. Lovell, um, I'd be more than happy to call your insurance for you unless that's something you really want to handle. However they respond is how I proceed. Mm -hmm. But, and I always tell them, hey, I'll call for you, Mr. Lovell, but just keep in mind it's your responsibility to make sure it gets added. So if I were to die leaving work today and I didn't call and you total your car in two months and it's not covered, there's no one to blame but yourself. I, I like to be really thorough. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just, but a friend of mine, Bought a Honda. Um, why well, don't we want to get to the details? But he bought a car, leased a car, and then exact car off the same dealership. Mm -hmm. The dealership never added his new car. So he's driving this car for two and a half years. Same car, same make, same model. It's just three years newer. He got his car spec. He got his car inspected there. He got his car worked on. And PA, when you get your car inspected, you need the insurance card. So this dealer looked at the insurance card, never matched up the VINs. No, they never noticed that it was the it was the old car, not the new car, and he totaled it. And for about a month, the insurance company wouldn't cover the totaled lease because it wasn't covered. The old car was covered, and he felt that that the dealership was responsible. Um, and I, you know, it, it ended up getting handled. It, it was one of those just things. With it was like it was uh, like Erie Insurance, but I was like, I wonder who is at fault there if it really didn't get covered. That is a very – I've never heard that. We would always verify the VIN number because it happened one time at Volkswagen where they sold the wrong car. Oh, I've and... done that like three times. <laughs> I've really done that three times. Yeah, I've, I've never done that. I, uh, I'd i yeah. always uh, go outside or John would go outside and we would verify the VIN number. So I've never personally had that happen. But that's a good question. Who's at fault? But Erie ended up covering it, right? Yeah, somebody higher up got involved and was like, I, I guess since they had been making insurance payments for two and a half years, you know, it wasn't like on a car they didn't technically have. I guess they just did it on a goodwill, like, you know, we're good clients, you have your home and all the other. It got covered. It, it ended up not being a huge deal. But at the time, I was like, this guy's screwed. Like, I think he's responsible. Although that's greedy on the, not greedy, but sloppy workmanship on the dealer. <laughs> In all accounts, not the salesman not calling, the service guys not noticing for two years and a half, two and a half years. Uh, you know, I did, that's just the customer's fault. And I did tell him, I said, this, this is technically your fault. I mean, you can be as mad as you want. It sucks, but this is, this is your fault. Was that you that did that? 
No, 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 no. It was not me. It was not me. I, I've sold the wrong car, but insurance always gets added. All right. Um, what else would you like to talk about? Anything, any advice you want to give people, any uh, followers that need to help you? What do you want to say to end it? Well, if you're a follower of mine and you've bought a car for the last 45 days, you can DM me with what you bought. I am doing uh, a podcast very similar to this. We're just going to talk about your car. So, I mean, I did one yesterday with a kid who bought a 2024 Camaro and just went through his deal, you know, went over the rate, his trade-in. And his dealership actually did something interesting. Let me know if you ever heard of this, actually. This kid, had the, he ordered the car in March. In May, the dealer calls him. They go, hey, we just got the allocation for your car. It's going to be later this year. Would you like to sell us your car? And we'll show it as a trade-in value when you pick it up. And, you know, he ended up buying in December. So he's like, um, yeah, I guess I would because trade-in values are so high. And, you know, it looks like things are coming down. So this this was part of the deal analysis. And I told this kid, I go, for you, this worked out phenomenally. I don't know the ethics of this. I don't know the legality of this. But you got it done. He gave me all his paperwork. It went through. Good for you. He sells them his 2019 Camaro for 19000 in May. Mm -hmm. this is where i caught this because he didn't mention this all to me until i'm looking at his deal and i'm like how did he get 19 grand for this trade in december of 2023 this car's worth 15 grand because you know how much stuff has dropped i go this stuff's worth 15 this car's worth 15 grand maybe 16 and i said hey how'd you get 19 grand for your car he goes oh i sold it to the dealership in may and they just told me they'd show it as a trade on the paperwork in december i'm like huh i never heard of that how can they do that if they don't take possession they did. They bought the car off him and then oh. sold it. But they bought the car off him in May, sold it in June, and then showed so it as a trade. driving it or anything. He yeah. really sold it to him. He really sold it to him. But I just don't know how they sold it as a trade because, you know, there's odometer statements that get filed with the, that paperwork. I mean, is that, I I told I told this kid, I go, you got nothing to worry about. I go, the only people who have something to worry about is the new owner and maybe the dealer. Maybe there's – and this is in my state they did this. This is in Pennsylvania. So the only thing that I would think of is – Thank goodness it didn't go to the next year because if it went to the next year, they got to write that off of their books or something because it's all, you know, accounting. So I would think that if it was one more month longer, it would have became a major issue. Yeah. I mean, I do not know how they did that. I, I said to the kid, I said, I don't really care how they did it because I'm, I'm here to analyze your deal, not the ethics of what another dealership did. And as far as I'm concerned, you got three or $4,000 more than market value on a December deal. So that worked out in your favor. And you know, and that was kind of the moral of the story in our video. And he he said something funny though. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, you ever seen someone like take a podcast and turn it into like just like a funny 30 second clip? Yeah. So in this video, you know, I'm doing this podcast, and he was like, Yeah, dude, it was awesome too, because I had my my Camaro, my trade in had a cracked headlight. So when they called me to come trade it in, I didn't have time to put the new headlight in. So when I pulled up to the dealership, I like pulled it up in a way like next to another car so they wouldn't even see the headlight. And I was like, that's sleazy. And people say car salesmen are sleazy. I was like, you're sleazy. <laughs> What's the name of your podcast? Uh, I didn't even name it yet. So, I mean, I'm literally editing it right now. Uh, it'll probably just be the Russ Flips Whips show, Russ Flips Whips podcast, good deal, bad deal. I mean, I'm not too worried about that. I mean, I was watching a video on some of the biggest podcasts and they've changed their names a couple times. So I don't think the name matters. Oh, so much. I'd go with Russ flips whips. Cause it's a brand in itself. You know, you got That's so many followers. Yeah. Was... People already know you. So it's yeah. automatically going to take off. Mm -hmm. I hope it does. Cause I really think it's some good stuff. Cause I do like entertaining people. I also enjoy educating people as well. So. So you're just going to look at deals like people when they buy cars. Is that the yeah. base of the podcast is going to be about? So he sent me his uh, retail purchase agreement, his install ins installment sale contract. And then I just pulled like his window stickers just to evaluate. You know, I went on Carvana, Kelly Blue Book, Mannheim, JD Power, figured out just rough values. He, and then I, I went even a step further. I said, what do you think a dealership would buy your 2024 Camaro? Let's, you know, cars lose value. This is a special car. It's the last year. You got the collector's, uh, Camaro collector's edition. How much money do you think you lost? Do you think that car is worth more money, less money? Because to analyze this deal in whole, we got to look at depreciation. How much did that car depreciate in one week? You just spent 60. Is it worth 70? Is it worth 30? 
And I made like 20 phone calls to a ton of different Chevy dealers, got, got through to a couple people. I didn't tell them what I was doing. So I tried to, I said, Hey, I got a 2024 Camaro. Here's the VIN. I don't, I hate it. What would you guys buy this car for? And most of them said about 50 grand, which I, you know, I think a lot of dealers are kind of scared of cars right now. 100%. I think he could probably get like 55 for that car, but I, the most I found a dealer willing to pay was 50. Because this the used car market's kind of scary right now. Was that your first episode? Yeah, it was my first episode. So when's it going to drop? Hopefully tomorrow. I I'm kind of I got I'm filming one Sunday, and this is my thought process. Maybe I'm overthinking it because sometimes people get I call analysis paralysis. You analyze too much, you end up doing nothing, which won't be the case. But as of right now, I'm doing nothing. I'm filming one on Sunday with a kid who I think is going to be a really good episode. I think he just got completely screwed. He leased the BMW X5 for like seventeen hundred dollars a month. He paid like eight grand in like back end products. I talked to some BMW finance guys. It's not the world's worst deal, but he definitely got you know taken advantage of. You know, like he bought the lease protection for twenty five hundred. That's normally sold for like fifteen hundred, maybe two grand. But then he bought this other product for like twenty five hundred that fixes dings, windshield, and wheels. And like, I'm just thinking on a lease, you should just get one or the other, you know, either if you get, if you get the one that covers it all, then what do you need the protection for? And it's like, I, I don't know. And then he bought a maintenance package for like 2,500 when BMW gives you a maintenance package for the first three years. So it's like, I'm going to say that. Yeah. He, yeah. And I asked him about all of it. I don't think he knows what he got. So I'm just going to talk to him. I'm not going to be rude. I might hammer him a little bit. There's a learning lesson. Like, come on, dude. Like, did you even negotiate? Did you just sign? And, you know. It just I, I haven't really talked to the kid much other than him sending me the numbers, but I might drop that episode first because I think a bad deal would be more interesting than a good deal because this Camaro kid did get a pretty good deal. I think that you are 100% correct. People love the bad aspect of things for yeah. whatever reason. It just creates more controversy. It just it draws people in emotionally. Mm -hmm. And then if they're in emotionally, then you know what? It's going to it'll take off. So are the people local that you find, or are they all throughout the U.S.? They're all through the U.S. So the one kid was not really local. He was out New Jersey, Philly area, probably five, six hours from my house. This one is a California kid, so he's from out in California. I mean, I creeped his Instagram. He looks – I don't want to say he looks like – he just looks like someone who'd probably take advantage of the dealership. I don't even know how to do it. If you went on his Instagram, you could probably just see what I'm seeing, you know, maybe a little bit of mommy, daddy money. Or maybe he's just like stupid rich and doesn't care. One or the other. So I'm going to find that out. So how do you find these people? I just put on my Instagram story. Hey, if you bought a car recently, DM me. That's awesome. And then there's a lot of like weeding through, you know, like I don't want to just do like a straight up good deal. So I, I knew this kid on the Camaro got a good deal, but it was a cool car. He seemed excited. Um, and I was like, well, let's look into it. You know, there was a lot of, you got a warranty. There was an interest rate. There was all this stuff. Like I just had somebody and I'm trying to figure out if he'll answer me, but I just had somebody. This is a good one. I thought he went to a dealership and did an even trade. I was like, that'd be, I want to talk about that. He bought a 2023 forerunner for like 50 grand and traded in like a Toyota Tundra. And it was like, he just gave him their car, got a new car. So I'm like, I want to see if you got a good deal or a bad deal. Cause I've never seen an even trade always be a good deal. No, it's usually to the dealership's benefit. Yeah, they're like, oh, yeah, even trade. <laughs> All right. Um, anything you want to end it with? Well, uh, what do you do, Mr. Lovell? I mean, you, do you, you don't work at a dealership. You mentioned you left your Ford store. Now you have the Lovell Group. Is that a sales training group? Yes. So when I was traveling, I didn't know what my next step was. I did not know just travel, just wanted a, a breath of fresh air because I was working 70, 80 hours a week for five years. And my wife and my me, my, just personally, just like, you need to help more people. And again, when I was training with the people at Ford, the salespeople, it made me just truly appreciate just helping one another. I think we live in a, especially COVID era, where so many people were just order takers. They didn't know sales. And they literally are just right now they're struggling and I'm helping some people just, it's just a very rewarding feeling. I want to give more back. I think a lot of times me personally, just speaking, when I sold cars, it was just trying to benefit me. You make as much money um, 
and I, I just want to do more good to the world. So that's why I started it. Now that video of you on the phone, the real viral one, you don't work for that dealer. That was you training. Yeah. So part of my agreement was with the dealership. When I went to them, they just, a lot of people around the Louisville area know me um, in the sense of just selling a lot of cars is very good. So I, uh, they reached out and they said, you know what, they needed help in the internet department. Um, they only sell roughly speaking about one out of three people. So 33% when people come on the lot. So um, my goal was is to go there, train them, but also I shot very low of how much I am worth personally. I told them a very low number that they would have to pay me a month. And part of the agreement was, is I would get to make content. And that's what I wanted to do because I don't know any other sales trainers that actually train in person, meaning actually do it like live. So many people sit there and preach to you yeah. and tell you what to say, but no one does it live. So that's why I thought it would do very good. And I put bad videos out there in the sense of, um, you know, one phone call that I kind of beat myself up on afterwards is I missed the opportunity to box him in on the first call and I'm making three calls to him and I still didn't sell the person and listening to it. You know, I'm a big fan of just critiquing myself, listening to uh, recording it, listening to it. And I missed the opportunity and I kind of beat myself up for about a week because I knew that I messed up and it just I usually don't miss opportunities or believe I do at least. And yeah, I posted good ones. I posted bad ones just because I wanted to show real, you know, good and bad calls. So I thought it would do very good. Now, I know there's a very conflicting uh, opinions on this and probably leaning towards um, the getting them in the store aspect. But I'll share my thoughts after. Well, what are your thoughts on selling a car entirely over the phone? Customer doesn't come in. Now, I'm not saying that's always your first approach. Doesn't want to come in, doesn't want to come in, doesn't want to come in. How do you feel about, hey, you know what, Mr. Lovell, we're pretty flexible down here at XYZ Dealer. If you want to purchase this car completely from home, we can we can accommodate that. Very good question. So when I sold Volkswagens, I did a ton of deals throughout the whole U.S. where my name just got out there. So I don't care. I'll work a deal over the phone. My main objective is to get the person there. Why? It's because it's so much easier to get them excited. It's so much easier to... Uh, just sell the car and you can make more money, just historically speaking, doing it that way. If they want to do it over the phone, you're going to make less gross. It's still a deal. You're still getting a customer. And if you treat it the right way, they're still going to come back to you where, you know, the last two years when I was selling Volkswagens, I'd sell people almost every single year. And how did I do that? Just by building a relationship. So I sold a ton of vehicles over the phone. So I'm cool with it. But my first and main goal is to get them there. If I can't get them there, then that's the next best option. And you can't ruin it where they won't come back to you in the future. So you can't do it that way. So it's a fine line, but I would always try to get the people there first. But I'm happy to do numbers over the phone as well. Does that answer the question? That's exactly how I feel. I made a video about how some dealers won't even appraise a trade over the phone. And and I even gave out my entire word track. This is something I made up. This is, I wouldn't even say made up. It just seems common sense. Hey, you know, you, you don't want to bring your car and don't want to bring your car and whatever. They're not bringing their car and you've tra everything that you know how to do as a salesman. I mean, hey, Mr. Mr. Lovell, I don't mind praising your car over the phone, but the last thing I want to happen is for us to walk back that number. We tend to be fairly aggressive down here at XYZ Motors. So if you can be transparent with me on your car and we make a deal right now, the last thing I want to do, the last thing I want to do is for when you come down, there's something on your car that you didn't mention and I have to walk the trade down. So I really, really, really want to honor this number. Can I go ahead and ask you a couple questions about your car? Boom, tires, brakes, dents, things, scratches, one to 10, rate it for me, does it run good? This, that, the other. Could you send me a couple pictures? All right, I'm going to take this to my manager. I'm going to get you the best deal right now. And people are like, that's terrible. Why would you do that? Get them in the store. Don't work with them. And I'm like, you're missing deals. That's an easy conversation to have. If your dealership's so busy that you can't have that conversation, I understand. But if you... Not most dealerships are that busy that they can't be working deals over the phone. Now, you're selling 65 cars a month. You don't have time for that. I get that. I did a ton of them when I sold that many cars. You know, uh, one of the oh, yeah, best there's always time. Ever. There's always time to have that conversation. You know, it's um, you just got to figure out what's important to you. And, you know, mine was just getting customers from a dealership standpoint, from a manager standpoint. They want people there because they're going to make more money. But from a salesperson aspect, I just wanted to get more clients to build my audience, just like social media. And if you do it that way, then 
if you do it in a good methodical way where they really enjoy it and have a good experience doing it over the phone, then that's cool. Whenever I would ship cars out uh, and I never met the people in person, I'd always send them a gift. No one does that. So I'd, I'd always send them like a cool gift. And somebody today uh, lives in Indianapolis and we still stay in contact with. She worked for a gummy bear company. My favorite uh, gummy bears, Albanese. If you haven't had them, try them. Mm. Amazing. And um, she bought cars from me every single year. And I've never met her personally. So that's you, awesome. You just, yeah, you just got to have people uh, give them a good experience like you do. You're very personable. I am, or at least uh, believe I am. And if you do that, then people will keep coming back. And, you know, I'm a huge believer in that. I just, you know, to build on that, making it hard to say no. You know, you make it sometimes some places make it really hard to say yes. You know what I mean? Like, and I was watching your video and I want your opinion on this, too. I don't think it's ever a good idea. But in, in that viral video, that girl had mentioned, you know, I understand the dealership explained they were losing money. So they had to charge me X extra. I had to buy the warranty because they're losing money. I don't think it's a good practice to ever mention if you're losing money on a car to a customer. I don't think they most of the time don't believe you, nor do they care, nor is that their problem. I'm not saying it's not true. I know that they were probably definitely losing money on that deal. I don't think you should ever guilt trip a customer because of that. how do you feel about that? Very good question. So me personally, when I was running the Ford store or the uh, Volkswagen dealership, because they trusted me where I could show numbers to anybody and build deals, do all of that, I would literally... I, you are right when customers typically don't believe that, where they're like, you're not going to lose money. But yes, sometimes they do. And I would literally turn my screen around and be like, this is, if they're wanting a bigger discount, I can't do that because of this. And if you can show them that, um, if you have the power as a salesperson, I've done that many, many times and it works. So, you know, from a regular salesperson standpoint, if they can't show it, then they don't need to say that though. But for me, I could always show it. So I would turn my screen around and I would show, you know what, we're losing $500, $800, $1,000. Uh, there's no more discounts to be made. This this is it. And yeah. of course, you know, you can go lower if you wanted to, but I don't want to lose more money. So that's that's my opinion on that one. No, and, I, and I, that's a good way of putting it. I can show it. I have access to see. I just have full access to everything. I don't think it's my place. I've seen my GM do exactly what you've done. And I think that's more his place. And sometimes when I have him, and I'm not, a, I love getting TOs. Like some of them, like my new sales guys, they don't even get TOs. I'm like, dude, like he might say something the same way I can say it, but he's the GM. It just holds more weight. Why would 100% does. And like I'd, I'd get on my salespeople at Ford when I, when they left without a TO. Like that's my biggest pet peeve. I believe that I'm, you know, I don't want to say better, but I can close at a higher percentage. So I, it was my pet peeve. So when people left, like one, uh, the funniest story ever, uh, for me personally, trying to do a TO, the uh, gentleman named AB, uh, he knows everything about Fords, every single thing, great product knowledge. And the customer was leaving, and that was like a big pet peeve again. And it was on a Saturday. We were busy, had other people there. And I literally took off running in dress shoes, dressed very nice, ran out there, and they were in like a Hyundai, like a little smaller car. And they were uh, about to pull off. And it's like at a slope where you got to kind of – speed up to get out and, you know, turn right or turn left. And I literally ran out there and I was knocking on the doors and my foot was underneath her tire and she ran over my foot and she ended up stopping. Um, you know, she rolled her window down like, Hey, I introduced myself. I got her to put it in reverse and she ended up buying an expedition. So awesome. I love TOs. Yeah. I love TOs. Um, you know, you did not let people leave. And if you did, then I'd sit down with you and talk to you and try to, you know, the next time where that doesn't happen again, but I'd never beat the people up. And I don't know why sales guys, if any sales guy listening, put your manager on the spot. Now, if you have a miserable manager, that doesn't work, but my general manager loves to sell cars. So if I, if I just sat down with the customer, say you were my manager and I think you'd be okay with this. Hey, Mr. Loveall, you have a second. Could you come over here? Hey, Mr. Absolutely. Hey, Hey, Mr. And Mrs. Jones, this is Mr. Lovell. He's our general manager. Just wanted to introduce you real quick. Hey, Mr. Lovell, just to give you a rundown. Mrs. Jones here is coming out of a Nautilus lease. We're trying our best to find something that's going to work for. I did. Go, and, and, and I get it. Not everyone can do what I do because I have everything else set up. Hey, we got a solid pick out there. That's that silver Nautilus. Mrs. Lovell really likes with the with the sandstone interior. She really likes it. She really wants to try and keep her payment the same. I kind of told her how things have gone up, but hey, I just I told her I'd get you involved. 
and let's try and put a deal together. You could you do a 36 month lease, lease 15,000 down for Mr. And Mrs. Jones here. And then I, once my manager is emotionally involved, it's a game changer. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And so you're, like, it's called working the desk. So you're working the desk on that one, you know, but, uh, but yeah, you're also in the aspect of getting a different voice. You're also in the aspect of getting them involved and they're like, yes, it's, it's drawing them in. So that's a good thing. So absolutely. I no problem at all. And I think too, and, and to, and, you know, working the desk for sure. But even if he gave me the same numbers, he would have, if I called him or whatever, Hey, got the numbers here from the general manager himself. More weight behind it, as you mentioned. Yeah. You know, and that's those numbers. Cause I used for like last year for a couple months, I started desking my own deals, doing everything on my own. And I just, it worked, but I just liked putting that on somebody else. Yes. Because if you ever have a bad deal, just like the trade, uh, yeah. then they're going to be like, what did you do? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> now, how was, um, how's business for the Love All group? Are you, how long have you been doing that for? So I started making videos in, probably two and a half months ago, and they didn't take off to begin with because there's, in my opinion, there's so many salespeople out there, trainers or so be trainers that they're truly not good at sales or what have you. And there's plenty of great ones as well. Uh, it didn't get a lot of views and I've been so successful in my career. And I've seen that in a humble way again, but um, it was very discouraging. And I've got uh, my wife pushes me in the good direction. She's very uh, encouraging uh, very good friend, Nathan Ludwig. He kept telling me it's going to catch on it's going to catch on. And then that's where I kind of thought where if I could do live phone calls because no one else does it, where it would truly work. And it did. Mm -hmm. So it, it's slower to start with it. You know, when you're selling cars or selling whatever, you can be broke today. And then a month from now, you can get a $15,000, $20,000 check. It can just, it's not that way building a business. It's, um, like just to use for an example, um, about a month ago, month and a half ago, I started making uh, videos for the training platform and I bought a very expensive camera. I didn't pay attention to something that's very, very important. So then when we started a podcast, I needed to be able to form uh, to record for a long period of time. And it only recorded for 30 minutes. So I spent a thousand dollars on a camera and then I realized, you know what, it can't record that long. So I was pissed. So yesterday I had to go up there to spend several thousand dollars getting a camera that actually can record for hours. Um, I can keep going on. Uh, when I started train, uh, filming videos uh, on the training platform, I did it on my cell phone to start with. And they didn't tell me I shouldn't do that because it's just going up and down and it needed to be going this way. So yeah. it was like, it was a pain in the butt. So I, I literally had everything recorded, uh, how to sell over the phone, 110 uh, videos, seven hours of full production. And then I had to do it again. Now, and, are, you, are you creating like an online community or is this a paid course? It's going to be a paid course. Uh, Bradley's um, platform, Lightspeed. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, they're the ones that's going to be hosting it. I hired them to kind of give me advice because I've never done this before. So I hired them to... Uh, to host it, to give me advice, to kind of walk me through the process. They didn't tell me about the phone that you, you really don't want to record on a phone. Um, so it's been a learning experience to say the least, bought some cheap equipment, and then you realize that cheap don't work. Um, so then I went and bought, uh, spent $4,000 on podcast equipment to make it first class. Uh, then my brother-in-law is going to come tomorrow to do all kinds of special stuff. We're behind me right now. It's the Love All Group. So tomorrow I'm going to have a huge sign, like an LED one. So I'm investing all kinds of money in it. It's um, it's a process in which it's not like sales where you can just kill it right out of the gate. It takes time. And I don't have the virtual training program that's live right now. So I'm giving out all kinds of free advice to people, helping people come up with scripts, uh, giving people free rebuttals that I came up with personally doing all kinds of stuff just to grow the audience. Um, and then hopefully when it goes live, they'll reciprocate, which I think they will. No, absolutely, man. Sound, sounds like you're really putting the work in, which which is super impressive. I mean, I, I know we've just filmed a podcast yesterday. I mean, I'm, I'm maybe the complete opposite of what you just mentioned. I'm I'm like firing from the hip. Webcam, no mic. And I was, my brother's like, you know, you're kind of saying, I'm like, Let's just get the same thing with the TikToks, you know, how they started. They weren't, we were going, we, I got in a quantity mode versus quality and then the quality came, you know, 
each way is a great way of doing it. It's just whatever works best for you, I think. Yeah. So a uh, funny story. So we signed up for Zoom yesterday or two days ago and we thought we had it. My wife is the more technology person. I am not. I'm very good people selling all of that good stuff. But when it comes to technology, she does everything. Yeah. So uh, we signed up for Zoom a couple of days ago. And then on this podcast, um, for whatever reason, it wasn't recording. So we kept trying to get it. And it, it mm -hmm. literally came down to the minute where I called Zoom up. I was like, it's not working. What is going on? And uh, literally two minutes before we were our uh, scheduled appointment, it literally started working. So uh, we thought we had it set up this morning at like 730 and we didn't test it. We had it set up, but it wasn't uh, it didn't work properly. So um, that's a funny story, too. You ever heard of StreamYard? No. StreamYard's pretty cool. Um, you can like it's a podcast what I just used. It was a couple hundred bucks, but um. Like it downloads. So after I don't maybe Zoom does this. I don't know. But after like when I podcast ended yesterday, it downloads the audio separate and then each video separately. And you can do whatever you want with them. What's so, the name? I'm already stream. I don't know if I can share my screen with you. I can I actually have it up. I'll definitely check that one out. Yeah, this is all learning to me as it is to you as you're starting. So the more advice I can get, the better I'm going to be. Oh, most definitely, man. Let me see if I can share my screen with you. I'll just show you. Yeah, it won't let me do it while I'm... So is that soundproof stuff in the back? Yeah, so this is... My brother really wanted to... Still is like an active musician. So, I mean, I guess he put all this up. I was kind of... At the time, I was mad because I'm like, dude, you rent this house off. Like, this is my house. You can't be putting stuff on the walls like that. But I guess it worked out because now it's my podcast room. Yeah. So my wife wanted to get that. And I was like, I don't think we really need it. But yeah, after you, I'm going to have to get it because of you. Nah, it's not necessary. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, my brother went out. He's he's probably like your wife. Like he bought me a ring light, which is whatever. He got me a mic, which I didn't even like using because I was like, dude, it's like it's in the way. Like, I don't know. Yeah, so I'm I'm pretty basic. I think I think sometimes keeping it raw is better. Now, if you're putting like a paid course like you are, that got to be high quality. Um, like every, I've never, you know, all that money on TikTok I'm making, that's just with my iPhone. So that's nah, a blessing. Cause I don't think people expect a high quality TikTok video. I mean, they're, they're clean and crisp, but. Absolutely. Not... Now do you, um, now is your course going to be bought and paid for one time or is that a reoccurring? Subscription? Two different options. You can pay for it up front. My selling over the phone, uh, mainly telemarketing for the most part in that aspect of it is uh, two different courses. I call it how to double your income over the phone in 90 days. Uh, one uh, series is a thousand. The other one is a uh, thousand. If you buy them together as a bundle, it's 1500 or you can pay for it monthly at 297. And then you'll also have access to how to sell over the phone. Also, you're going to do car dealerships. Somebody asked me to come down there and train RV people next month in Florida. So I'm going to be doing that. I'm going to create a course on that. Um, I'm helping somebody right now doing solar. So I'm going to have a course on that. So I'm going to try to create a ton of different courses because, um, and hopefully you can answer that question as well. I think sales, if you can sell one thing, you can sell anything, you know, so. No, that's amazing, man. I would, um, I know this is real big too. I don't know if it's on your radar not something I, I mean, I'm into real estate. Not I'm not really into this, but wholesaling, and that's all phone calls. Are you familiar with wholesaling real estate? I am. I think those dudes would eat up what you got to say in terms of over the phone selling because I hear that they suck. I mean, I hear the wholesaling. I've I've dabbled in it, but when I go to wholesale something, I mean, th maybe this is me because I have a little bit of money to play with. When I went to wholesale a house, I just ended up buying it because it was a good deal. You know, it was like, oh, wow. I mean, I got this phenomenal deal. Why would I sell it to this guy and make 20 grand when I can just buy it and make 200 grand over 30 years? You know, that's, that's how my brain works. So I ended up buying the deal. But uh, those There's guys, one I, guy that I really like, and he calls it like King Fam, I think it is. He call, He's like money. He, like, he says money in a different way. Yeah, I know you're talking about. I don't know his name. But uh, but he, he, he's he got very good content as well. But uh, I've never personally done that. So I don't know anything about wholesaling real estate. It's tough, but the phone part is all just a verbal commitment. You know, the other stuff is like the back end of getting signed contracts, title companies, the like the actual getting somebody to agree to sell the house, you know, hey, Mr. Lovell, I, after talking to you about your house, I'd offer you 45,000. Now, obviously that's a terrible way to go about it, but 
that's the phone skills. Is, okay, I'm going to, you know, you your your part would be you get them to the point where it's, okay, I'm going to email you the contract. And I think you'd be really good at that because I think you're really good on the phone. Thank you. I appreciate the compliment. Yeah, um, I think that if, you know, if you can sell one thing, you can sell anything. So I, I just do relationship selling, get people to like me, show a sincere interest in the other people. And it's always worked out for me. That's awesome. I'm glad yeah. we did this, man. I, uh, I didn't know you were this successful in the car business. I knew nothing about you. Did a little bit of homework of like scrolling through like 10 of your TikToks, but I'm, I fire, I've been firing from the hip my whole life. I'm not saying it's the way you should operate. It just always worked for me and everything I've always done just kind of, oh, I was like, who you interviewed? You do a podcast. You thought I was doing my podcast. Said, oh, no, no, I'm doing somebody else's podcast. She goes, who? I was like, I don't know, Mr. Lovell. She goes, who's Mr. Lovell? I was like, I don't know. And someone tagged me in his video and then I remembered I'd seen it and I like the way he talks. <laughs> Well, when I come up there, I'll reach out to you. Uh, I know you said that you're a uh, Pittsburgh fan. You go to baseball games as well or just football? I'll go to the Pirates game. It's not to watch them play, but maybe just to have some, like, social fun. Yeah. See, I'm a Cubs fan, so we um, – I grew up watching WGN, and uh, okay. when I'd get home from uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, I'd always uh, watch their games because they didn't have night games because they didn't have uh, lights. So they would always be on when I got home from school. So I became a Cubs fan, and they were always, for the most part, terrible. Um, so when I went to the games, it always just to be a have a good time, like you mentioned, because the Pirates are in the same division, and they're typically not that good, just like the Cubs. Now, do you think salesmen should answer the phone calls or the BDC, if, if you have a BDC, should answer? Because I've been fighting with my dealership for two years now. And our BDC guy is okay at best. He's an order taker. And, and if he listens to this, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm being rude to you, man. I don't think he'll hear this, but the sales guys should answer the sales phone calls, in my opinion, or at least a limited number of them that you feel comfortable. There's not a person in my dealership who can answer the phone better than me, but I don't get the phone calls. You know, I'll get a lead like, hey, Russ, I just talked to Mr. Jones. I think this one's just better suited. You talk to him. But it's like, why can't I just phone rings? I answer like that's how it should be. In my it should opinion. be you're one hundred percent correct because the first person talks to him is the one. Don't don't judge a book by its cover. So the first person, if they're not that good, are they going to want to talk to the next person? The answer is probably not. So, you know, when I ran the internet department at Volkswagen, I would always um, my goal, me and John, was one or two minutes. We answer the phone three minutes or under. Meaning, like to answer internet leads, you're talking about inbound calls. So, and the leads, you know, the leads too. We don't get the leads, dude. I'm like, I'm you, you like, definitely don't want to do that. If I was running it, I would do it completely different because, you know, when I went and worked at a Kia dealership long, long time ago, I think this was in 2015, I think it was, uh, they had a BDC and the manager there, the GM, knew about me again. And he's like, I need you to prove them wrong. And I went in there for 60 days and killed the BDC because I'm way better on the phone, way better selling. And I mean that again in a humble way. I hate bragging, not me. Um, and it's they bad. literally got yeah, they got rid of their entire BDC because of me. And I, I've never been the one to like a BDC. I want the salespeople because they have an invested interest. Um, I've never been the one to like a BDC, someone else picking up the phone, you know, We'd always at the car lots that I've worked at, you know, it rings on all of the desk and whoever yeah. picks it up, they're excited because they actually got to pick up the phone, you know? And then a hungry so, uh, guy like me just grabs it, doesn't look at the call. Like, I see people like, who is it? Who's calling? I don't even look. I could be, you know, hello, it's Russ. Uh, why would you look to see who's calling? Just say, you're at work. Just answer it. What do you hide? Yeah, bad. Well, why do they do it that way? Because they've always done it that way. Um, I'll just say it because the owner's son is in charge of it. Okay. Well, there's nothing. I mean, that's just the facts. That's just, that's yeah. why uh, I think we were talking about getting rid of it, maybe getting the leads down to the floor. And then he got a little bit more involved and that was kind of his department. What do they close that monthly? Do you know? Like, I don't closing. know. Not good. The sales floor, we close at 50% across the board or more every month, good. year long but we're not getting a ton of leads in. So 50%, that's awesome. Um, BDC, I would change it, you know, but I'm not running the dealership. 
Uh, well, I'm going to call my, my general, like I said, my general manager, like my dad's. When we hang up, I'm going to say, hey, I just got off the phone with Mr. Lovell. I don't know if you know who he is. He sold 64 cars a month, you know, at a Volkswagen store. And I'm, I'm going to have this conversation. Because I've been having this conversation for months now because it annoys me. And then they pick favorites because, and I'm sure maybe you don't go through this because you have a little bit of a more bubbly personality than I do. I can be a little bit more brash sometimes, but not everyone in my dealership likes me. So sometimes internet leads don't even get given to me because personal reasons, not be, you know, not bragging. I'm the best salesman in my dealership. I should get every available lead when I'm available. I think if you want to make money, like if you, if you, if you get your best running back or your backup running back and the best running back's ready to go, give him the ball. Now, if he's Absolutely. busy, he can't play that day, you got your backup, go ahead and give him the ball. But I mean, that's the way I think about it. That's how I'd run well, my story. Yeah, tell Uncle Jimmy. And I, I think that's what you said his name was. Yeah, Uncle Jimbo. Tell, yeah. Help it. Yeah, absolutely. Change it up. Try it. You know, if they tried and it works, then great. If it doesn't, they can always go back to it. But I would, in my opinion, it'll be a lot more successful. Um, the, the leads will probably get answered quicker. It'll probably be a higher percentage closing ratio, in my opinion, as well. And, you know, Every lead that you all get, do you all send a video out to them of the car itself? No. See, that's something that I did. Like I worked at a very big automotive group and the second month I was there, I developed like a process and they have about 40 different dealerships and we were number one uh, the second month once I put that implemented that process in. And one of the process steps was every person gets a personalized video of the car. If it's not, if they just inquire about a generic Altima, I'd go outside and show them like um, the camera, all kinds of different Altimas on the lot. So that will help the internet closing percentages as well. Interesting. How would you yeah. send, how would you send the video text, email? So they were very process oriented and they protected themselves. So we would have to send it. Um, they never, they had the right tools in the sense of like, uh, it was called snap sale and they had the right platform, but they just didn't require people to send it. So I would have to send it through that. They did not want me to send it through text. Uh, some dealerships that I've worked for, they don't care. And I would send it through just my own personal cell phone. So it just depends upon the dealership. You're a standalone dealership. So if they, you know, you can get sued by sending text messages, supposedly. I've never personally went through that experience, but uh, that's just what I understand. So that's why they wanted to send it through like a third party. Yeah, um, I think it's I think it's a gray area. I think it depends like how you how that text came. If you I think if you text the lead fresh from a personal cell phone, that's a no, no. But hey, Mr. Mr. Love All, this is Russ calling you from your work line. Da, 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 da. Hey, I'm going to give you my, I'm going to shoot you a text from my cell phone. That way I, I, we can answer a little quicker. Is that all right with you if I text you from my cell phone, Mr. Love All? Yeah, go Absolutely. ahead. I think that's okay. But yeah, I don't think you should answer the lead initially from your text. I think that's where you could get sued. Yeah. So uh, they told me that uh, because I asked the question, I was like, so why can't we do it? And they said, because you don't give them the, op the option to opt out in the text message is what they said. And I said, why don't I just add that? at the end of it to opt out. And he said, always a salesperson trying to figure out a way to, but then the second month, uh, once I implemented that process, we were number one out of like 38 different dealerships. They came down there like, whatever you need, I will do it for you. And, you know, it, it changed completely. At first they were like this guy and, you know, but then uh, killed it. And they're like, and that's when I really took off and more people knew about me and the talents I have. Yeah, no, that's awesome, man. I mean, that's, it's inspiring because if I'm not, if I'm being, truly transparent my sales have lacked these last month and a half two months i've kind of been on cruise control selling 13 15 17 cars because i've been really focusing on the social media but then i hear a guy like you selling 65 cars and i'm like okay i can still hammer car sales and make the videos there's time for both you know just because the social media is my primary income right now doesn't mean i can't boost my sales what if i made 25 grand doing both you know why can't i do that I know you said you kind of just go with it. Do you map out your day? Like, do you have like a, like me personally, I map out every hour of my day. I've always done that. And kind of, you know, when you're selling cars, you kind of get deviated sometimes, but I've got a blueprint of what I want to accomplish for the day. Do you do anything like that? No, like I truly show up to work, like eat my breakfast real quick and whatever. Bro. You know, I mean, I, I won't even lie. I just, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm something that I'm not. 
whatever the yeah. day the day brings. I mean, I generate some stuff on my own. There's always something going on, you know, but just go with the flow. Just, very country club vibes, you know. <laughs> Yeah, nothing wrong with that. You know, but you're where I'm built for more though. And I'm so I'm sitting here talking like I can do more. I, there's so many wasted hours in the day. I think I am talented at sales enough to to be selling more cars, to be generating more prospects, to make more phone calls and and just be more like you. Yeah. How many calls do you make a month? I would have no idea, honestly. No. No, I like don't. me, I just always track all numbers. So I, you know, that's why I was just curious. No, and I, you know, that's something we've talked about is like, if you, Mr. Biondi, the owner read, a, you know, talks about this book he always read that if it's like, if you want to get more home runs, you got to get more at bats. And if you want, you know, you, you start backwards. So where, you know, that starts with the, with the activity and then the activity will bring the rest. And, you know, I, we were tracking and charting. I am tracking and charting this year. So it's like, Oh, what are we on the third working day of the month? I'm off today. So I've worked. So I worked the second, third and fourth. I've had six ups, three cars sold. I'm probably got two going tomorrow. Well, good job. Congrats. Let's off to a better start this month. We'll see. Well, you said you started off last year uh, early in the month, like almost 30 cars every month. Yeah. So you got to do it this year. I know, right? It's just 360 like... cars. That'd be crazy. I uh, I think I did, I don't know, whatever 18.2 times 12 is, whatever that comes out to. That's what I averaged last year with two sloppy months. It's just like, I don't even want to say hard. It's just my mind has been in a completely different place these last three months because of the social media money and where I'm like, well, where can I take that? But, I, you know, I'm trying to go here, but I'm still here. And this might not always be here. This will always be here. And it's like. You got to figure out which one's more important. I but can do, you could you can do both is the real answer, you know. Well, really, I do both. Like my videos are all made at the dealership. Like I've every video I've ever made is within our dealership lot. Have they ever complained where it's taken away from your sales? Um, my GM has a little bit, um, and that's where I kind of had to tell him how much money I was making. Yeah, you know, dude, cool with these stupid videos. Why don't you worry about making some money? I was like, well, actually. I'm making more doing that. Yeah. And it's like, dude, it's kind of stupid. Like I'll go like the, the least I make off of video is like 250 bucks, like the minimum. Yeah. Like every video. Some of them make $3,000 for a TikTok. Do you go onto YouTube and post them as well? I post YouTube shorts. They don't make as much money. Um, TikTok just pays excre extremely lucrative. Like I get similar views on my Instagram and might make 800 bucks a month. I, they don't pay very well at all. TikTok has this weird like RPM, which is rate per milli, which is how much they pay you for a thousand views. It varies. It could be, I've heard some creators as low as 30 cents, a thousand views, you know, and I was floating around a dollar per thousand views. And if you see my views, you know, that adds up pretty quick, but it's qualified views. So they have to see it on the for you page. It couldn't have been sent to them via text and all this other jazz. So it's not always 5 million views on the video equates to 5 million views paid. But like the last like month, I've been at like $2 RPM, which is like, damn, ridiculous. Like, I don't know what, I think it's the educational videos really, because people are like, it's more valuable content, I think. Like, one hundred percent. Yeah, I read something because I'm I love reading again. So I read something where it shows that they set aside a billion dollars over the next three years to give away just in the U.S. alone. So I always heard that they, and, and brings up a story. So when I started the Love All Group, I was so excited to just tell people about it. So I set my TikTok up as a business, and they don't pay a business account. Did you know that? No, I didn't. So uh, somebody pointed it out to me and they were like, uh, once I announced that I was going to have a podcast, they were like, you need to change your TikTok because you're missing your monetization. I said, what do you mean? I didn't even know. And they was like, your account set up as a business. You need to do it a personal. So I recently changed it to that, but I had no idea. You know, I've never made money off of social media. Um, so I had no idea at all. So, well, I'll so tell that you was interesting. Trouble. I will save your number. I was, I was going to save it anyways, but. 
I will save your number and you will help me with car sales. And I think I can help you with content because I do think I'm I think I'm a better creator than a salesman. I'm a I'm a good salesman. I'm a darn good car salesman. But I think I'm a very good content creator. You are. I would agree with that. 100 percent Yeah. And I love car sales. I have no I have no desire to leave the business. But over these last couple of months, just with the traction it's gained, I was like, I think I'm better at this. That doesn't mean I gotta stop doing the other. This is just another you know plate that i'm going to juggle here but i do think there's things i do in my videos to get people to watch longer i say things a certain way i open a video a certain way i know how to be controversial in the right way i can predict what the comments are going to say my brother yeah. thinks i'm crazy i'm like dude we're gonna make this video here's the comments are going to say this or this and everyone's going to argue he's like how do you know i go i know do you get a lot of hate on social media no no i think i'm I don't think I'm like a well-liked guy. I don't think it's like, you know, like, people are like, oh my gosh, Russ Flips Whip's the greatest. But I, I think it's probably pretty neutral. No one, I've never had like someone like DMing me threatening to kill me. Yeah. <laughs> are you mechanically inclined? To like work on things, like cars? Yes. A little bit. You know, when I got my first truck, I changed the oil. I did brakes on it. Uh, I could, I did a fuel pump on my tractors. I mean, I'm not like an, an idiot, but I'd rather just pay someone to do it. Me too. I, I'm not mechanically inclined at all. Last time I tried to jump a car, I blew it up. So I'm not mechanically inclined at all. Put them on all. the wrong way. I put them on the wrong way and it literally was like smoke went everywhere. And uh, I've done you know, that. I, yeah. So uh, they were like, no more jumping cars for you. Uh, changing tires, not for me. Uh, like I'm not mechanically inclined at all. I'm very good with people uh, face to face over the phone. Very good in that aspect. But when it comes to mechanics and that, I'm terrible. Absolutely terrible. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not a good mechanic. I have done a couple of things, but I, I'm with you. I think my God given talent is talking to people, getting them to like me. And I always keep it real. So, like, there are some people who don't like me, not so much in a sales setting, but like, I always just tell people how I truly feel. You know what I mean? I can like, rub somebody the wrong way. Yeah. Like, my brother who rents an apartment off me ordered the Ford Maverick and I got the completely base one XL stripped out. And he's like, I am going to get a Lariat. I go, what the hell's wrong with you, dude? Are you an idiot? You rent an apartment off me, buy a house first. Like what's the matter? You know, and I just can't help it. It just comes out. It might come off a little brash, but you know what? You have a good head on your shoulders versus trying to encourage him to make a smart decision versus a Lariat 30,000 base levels. What? Like 20 grand, I believe it was. Yeah. So you can save him 10 grand. You can save him all the money and he can, you know, like you said, buy a house or do something smarter because that truck is not going to be like the COVID era where they were selling for seven grand over like that one that you were saying in that story. Yeah. So, you know, uh, you probably helped him out. Did he go with the Lariat? I talked him down to an XLT. It wasn't so the <laughs> He's like, I need heated seats. I'm like, dude, your big brother who makes five times what you do has four. And I'm just saying, I'm like, he's my brother. I'm like, that has four houses, doesn't need heated seats. Why do you need heated seats? He's like, I just need them, dude. And I'm like, okay, I can't expect everyone to be that frugal mindset I have. So I was glad to at least talk him down to the XLT. They do five grand or so. Yeah. Did, did y'all get hybrids? Yeah, we both did. I love it. Good. So I would, do you... Do you have to train? Do you have to drive a lot of way, to, a long ways to work every day? Not really. Maybe fifteen minutes there, fifteen minutes back. I just felt the hybrid would have better resale. It does. More people want it when I sold Fords, at least. So yeah. Yeah, I mean Carvana's most recent offer. Now I did D plan, so I legally have to keep it. Not legally, I have to keep it for six months. So I I, I will because I don't want to mess up the D plan privilege. So I will keep it for a little bit, but Corvon offered me like 29 for to pay 22 and a half after uh D plan. So we'll see what I do with it. I kind of like it. Yeah. So I got a big body Bronco. Uh, so that's what I currently drive. So I like it too. I got it on D plan as well. Nice. Nice. You like the Bronco? Love it. Uh, drives very good in my, I've had Jeeps and other things, other vehicles, it doesn't drive. It drives better than a Jeep Wrangler. So uh, Jeep oh, Wranglers are very rough, and it's quieter. It rides smoother. I very much enjoy it. So yeah. Yeah, I was surprised. My wife has an F one fifty, and as I said, I'm pretty frugal. But sometimes I see something that I like and do just want to buy. And I said, Hey, why don't we trade your F one fifty in on a Ford Bronco? 
And she didn't want to. She likes it. She's like, I will drive a big vehicle till the day I die. She wants an F-150 Navigator Expedition. And I was like, I was surprised. I feel like she would have wanted it, but I was I was upset because I, I, I was like me who wanted it, but. Yeah. Which trim level was you going to get? The base level or the wild I track? Or? So she needs heated seats too. Everyone, everyone I know just needs heated seats. So it would have. I didn't. I didn't look too into it, but I would have got a. I would have got the two seven for sure. Um, I would have got one with the two seven hard roof and uh, automatic and heated seats and a touchscreen. I mean, I don't know. I don't remember the packaging, but I, if I remember, well, a four door one would have been floating around fifty thousand. The way I was going to yeah. order it. Awesome, man. Well, it was an absolute pleasure having you on there. Um, if you ever need anything from me, feel free to get get in contact with me anytime. And when I'm up there in Pittsburgh, I will reach out to you and we can catch a game or do something. Yeah, definitely, man. This was, this was a long talk. I didn't two hours went by. <laughs> I didn't uh, just not looked at the phone 453. So, yeah, I agree. It, uh, when you're talking to one another and just being being personable, time flies. Yeah, I've done podcasts where it's like, get me out of here. But this was actually a really fun talk. So I wish you the best of luck, Mr. Loveall. It was really nice to meet you. You're an inspiration. I'm going to call my GM right now about this whole BDC debacle and maybe get things moving in the right direction. All right, buddy. Wish you the best. Thank you so much. All right. Love you, man. Love you.